Hey everybody, this is Terry. Today is December 18th, and this is the IPFS Local and Offline Collaboration Group um, having our monthly call. We're super excited to get started. A um, few different demos today, so we will jump right in. Um, Michael, do you want to share your screen to sh tell us a little about Braid? Sure, let's see if I can find the buttons for that. On mine, it's the green one at the bottom center. Ah, yeah, you're right. Okay. I think this button will probably work. Let's try that. Okay. Can you see this? Sure. Yep. Cool. Um, okay, so, um, and how much time should I go for, Terry, here? Um, is 10 minutes enough for a presentation sure. and some questions? Or? All right. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so, um, so I've been working on Braid. Now Braid is a, an attempt to decentralize the web using standards. Okay, so I wanna, I'm, I'm, I've prepared this talk as a bit of a, a pitch or an argument. I wanna see if you guys agree or disagree that we can decentralize the web just through, through like a standards effort. And so we, to take this back, um, what was kind of like the web, like uh, used to be these closed networks like AOL and CompuServe, um, they also had a lot of the features that we have on the web now, like shopping and chat and forums and stuff like that, but they couldn't connect to each other. There's just these giant centralized monoliths. And the web was able to decentralize. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was a decentralized alternative that could outcompete them. And the web outcompeted them because it, um, there is two things that it did. Um, it made it easier for people to add new content so um, when you, it was easier to throw up a website or a web page, anybody could do it, much easier than it was to convince the CEO of AOL, Steve Case, to add your content to AOL. And that meant that all of the, like there are about a million programmers out there on the web. There were only, you can only have maybe a thousand programmers in your company. And a million programmers is gonna be able to make a lot more stuff than the thousand programmers. And so that meant that a lot more content was being added. The second thing that, that the web did, and the web was able to, it was easier to do that partially because not only do you have a standard, but you have these libraries um, that made it, so you didn't have to write most of the code. If you're gonna replace AOL, that's a lot of code. But if you just wanna put up a web page, all you have to do is write the HTML. Everybody already has browsers. There are already servers out there. And so that makes the developer's job a whole lot easier to add new content. Um, now we're at a similar, we're at like this, um, at, at a higher scale now, websites themselves have become the giant centralized entities. And so my thesis here is that we're gonna be able to decentralize these websites by extending the standards again and adding new libraries that are gonna automate stuff and make the developers' lives easier. And then we're gonna be out, able to outcompete the thousands of programmers at Facebook with the millions of programmers on the web. And it's gonna look something more like this. Um, do you guys, is this, can you see the right side of the screen? I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. I can, I mind. Okay, good. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to go quickly now through. So Braid is an extension to HTTP that adds some new features. It makes it much easier for you to make websites. And it makes it easier for you to share the state within websites. And that allows us to build more of a mesh. Okay, so I'm going to, um, so the problem that we're solving is that the web just, it, it didn't add enough. I'll, I'll just take you through it. So the web was designed for, for static pages. So HTTP transfers some HTML from a server to a client. Okay. And that made a lot of sense when pages were written by hand. Um, and there, but like what happens if the page changes? They didn't have any way to update the client when the page changes. So they just added this reload button. Okay. So this is going to be a common theme. Um, and that was like, that made a lot of sense at the time when pages looked like this, you're writing the HTML by hand. They're really not changing that often. Yeah, just have the user click reload, no problem. But then pages started changing more and more. We started getting these databases that would generate the actual page. Um, and they might change like every week or every couple of days or, you know, when someone reloads it. And so then you had a, you started having this new model. You have a database down here. Um, and then in order to do that, well, you didn't made an MVC framework. And that was like, okay, now we need a, a, a way to structure this changing data 
uh, model view controller is the uh, pattern for synchronization for object-oriented programming that was developed at Xerox Park. Um, so when we, whenever we see uh, MVC, I think this is a way to synchronize. You have some data in the model, you're going to update multiple views whenever it changes. Um, over time, pages started changing more and more. So 2011, like this is a, a feed of, this is just a Facebook feed, um, snapshot it every day for um, some student for a month. And um, then JavaScript started happening. So now you could pay, change a page on the client without hitting reload, and that was pretty cool. Um, but you also want to be able to get data from the server. So then we added XML HTTP requests, and um, you kind of know that that API wasn't really thought through because it's called XML HTTP requests. We don't use it for XML anymore. Um, and now we have pages that are kind of, they're changing all the time. And you actually expect them to be live updating real time as people change stuff somewhere else. But there's still this reload button. And the, what does a reload button do now? Well, it's just like in case the code doesn't really work. <laughs> um, because we have piles and piles of code. And when you write a web app now, you need all of this junk. Um, then we had to throw in React. And this is why web programming just totally sucks today. There's a pile of junk. And all of this is here just to handle change. So this is what we're going to solve. Okay, and this is all because HTML, HTTP itself just never handled change in the protocol. So instead, we're like working around it with all of this crap. And um, every time you build a website, you do it in some non-standard way. You just figure out a way to do it, and everyone has a different way to do it. None of our ways are compatible. And that means that it's much easier for us to access data on our own site than access data on someone else's site. And we're not sharing, we're not collaborating, and we just build these silos. So, the Braid protocol extends HTTP with synchronization so that you don't need any of this crap. We're going to throw in, um, and instead, we're going to actually do synchronization super, super well. It's a hard problem. But we, now we have CRDTs, we have operational transform, we have version control. And the Braid protocol supports every met, all these methods of synchronization. It's agnostic to the particular one, but, it gives, but you can uh, get all of their features. And that means that, so on the left, this is how we build websites today. We have this whole stack of stuff. And each one's different. And every time you build a website, you have to wire together everything in a different way. With Braid, HTTP itself handles the synchronization. And so every, every piece of state, you access it the same way. Every piece of state has a URL. And let me show you what that means. So here's, let's say we have a Braid website. Every black dot here is a URL. And you can access it from the client, from the server uniformly. Um, and that means that you can also access some data on some other server just as easily as your own server. Or you can make a different user interface. That different user interface can access data on whatever server it wants. And this lets you make a new user interface for any website that you have. And every user themselves could even have their own user interface. And so we can get a separation between the UI and the state behind it and you can create your own UI. So you no longer have like um, a monopoly power. Like right now, just because Facebook has all this data, everyone has to see their friends the same way. But if we build our social sites on Braid, everyone can see their, their sites however they want. This I think goes along with a lot of the local first approaches as well. Like we're seeing this, we're seeing people separating the state from whatever's happening locally. Um, Okay, and when I just drew, I don't know if you could see that transition, but you could also have things peer to peer. So every little black dot is a URL. You can access any URL anywhere else. Um, so um, to do this, um, one of the, the, the big trick that makes this work super well is great technology with CRDTs and operational transform that collapses differences, distances between time and space. This lets you program with state locally or remotely just as easily. So you can access state on any website. You can read and write it as easily as a local variable. And you can do that in the same offline first way as a CRDT lets you do, because any changes that happen on any two computers merge in the same way. So um, this is an abstract model that lets us, like what you're seeing right here, this is what we call a braid. This is the reason why the protocol is called a braid. Every colored region here is a, let's see if I can pause it. Oh, no, that's, okay, I think I have to click. Can I click? Okay. So every colored region here is a patch. And these are three different computers, one, two, and three. You can see the network messages at the bottom that they're sending. So they're sending these little set messages. They have a patch 
this patch says replace region from 00, zero with ZZZ. It gives it a version ID and it says which parent versions it comes from. And these patches are just getting broadcast around the network. They receive them in different orders or different sequences. They each have some text at the top and that text is getting synchronized by aggregating all these patches together. And so the colored regions are patches. Um, the, a region like this is a merge. And so it merged this ZZZAAA with ZNNNNGZ, and it got ZNNNNGZAAAAA. And as long as every computer merges any two patches in the same way, they'll reach a consistent resulting state. And so what we, the, the, so this is the, the basic model of a braid. You have patches, you can fork when two things at the same time, and you can merge together. And in order to get consistency, all computers have to merge in the same way. And so in order to do that, we just add something to HTTP called a merge type. The merge type says how two things merge together. And I think that's the next slide. Perfect. OK, great. So now here's the actual protocol. So this is a, um, a put request in HTTP. Over here is a get request. And we're adding a couple features. So um, we're adding versions. We're adding patches. And then with gets, we also add subscriptions. OK, so um, this first, first phase of Braid doesn't have any peer-to-peer -peer features. But the data model of the Braid, which you just saw on that last page, that visualization, that totally supports peer-to-peer -to -peer, uh, uh, messages. We just don't have a network transport yet. OK, this is just let's get that data model and let's extend that into HTTP. And it turns out HTTP is already really, really close. OK, so we just add, so we add versions, patches, and subscriptions, basically, so, and merge types. So I'm going to walk you through this. So over here on the left, you can do a put. And then you specify a version. The version is just some unique string, opaque. It's whatever it is. You can encode in here a version vector if you want. So different CRDTs or operational transforms will use different data types for versions. Whatever it is, you can encode it in a string. All that Braid cares about is that it's unique. OK. Then you encode the parent versions. And the parent versions is going to be a sequence. So you put string, and it's going to comma for a string. Here's the one with multiple parents over here. Um, it has a content type, so this one's JSON. And it has a merge type. So sync9 is the name of the algorithm that's doing that merge. And so as long as all the clients and, peer and servers implement sync9, they can all merge the same way. Now this put is contained with two patches. OK, so it says patches two. and now the, um, and now it knows that it's going to find two patches. So here's one patch, and here's the other patch. And each path has a, has a content length so that you know how long it is and you know when the next patch starts. Um, now here's an interesting thing, content range. So this is um, specifying a patch. So every patch re replaces some region in, in the document with another thing. So this is replacing the region that's specified with JSON of dot messages. And then, uh, from, and then inserting from one to one. So it's just inserting a, a, a nothing, kind of like an empty, uh, a single location. It's inserting this. And so this is an array with an object. This is basically a message. So this is a chat, and the person just posted a message to the chat. Um, and here, it's now saying that the second patch said, at the JSON of dot latest change, you're going to add this object. OK, and this is the date. Um, with a value of some number. And so this would be like at editing a message in a chat. And then you get a response that says, OK. So this is the basic format where we're adding to put requests. And then for a get, the, the big feature we're adding is ability to not just get one thing, but to subscribe to all upcoming changes until you're done. And that gives, that's, that's like a key thing for synchronization. Um, and so we have this, a similar thing here. We say get, you just have the header subscribe, and you say keep alive. And then the response, you have multiple patches coming in. And each one is a, the same format, like over here. You can also, I think one of these is, has no patch. Let's see. Yeah, this one doesn't even have a patch. This is just giving you a full. So you can just give the full body of the resource if you want. Or you can say patches colon one or whatever it is, and you can give it in patches as well. OK? Does that make sense, guys? Cool. Um, so um, I didn't have a demo prepared. Sorry. We'll have a demo, a really good demo in a couple months, maybe sooner. Um, uh, 
uh, just working on it. Um, so some of the benefits though, so you never, the reload button becomes unnecessary. This, the algorithms can automatically guarantee that things are in sync. All updates can get pushed automatically. Caches never get stale. You don't have to, we get rid of all these stupid heuristics like max age and HTTP headers, and you have to like get your cache control right or otherwise things are gonna cache right. It's just handled automatically, which is really cool. Network becomes a lot more efficient. It'll only send a diff. You know, if you go to Facebook a second time, it's just gonna send you a diff from the last time. Uh, if, if, a, if a resource like a file changes, it'll always send you a diff. It's never gonna redundantly send you stuff again. You have to write a whole lot of code because you're not wiring together things anymore. You like most of the logic that I that we write in web apps is just synchronization logic, and this automates all that. This is the seventy percent is just. An, I don't have any like theory for it. Uh, I mean that's the theory for it, but we've noticed this in our just our experiments. We re rewrite programs using this model and uh, our web apps, and it just gets rid of a, about seventy percent of code pretty consistently. Um, and that's, that's kind of a cool result. We also get an offline mode for free, um, which I think is relevant to offline first. You get collaborative editors and everything. Um, the server can go down. Your app can kill, well, especially we don't have, um, well, I don't have yet um, a peer-to-peer -peer mode over WebRTC, but we do have one working in the lab and um, that allows the server to just go down. Your peers keep connected and you can continue chatting. The server can come back up if you want. Or if you don't like that server, you can switch to another one. You know, someone can like fork it. Um, and okay, cool. I think that was probably about 10 minutes. So that's the website. Um, Thank you. Yeah, cool. Questions or anything? Yeah, let's take a few minutes for questions. What do people want to ask? Hi, right. so this is very cool. Uh, first of all, it's somebody that worked on a CRDP-based framework and knows how challenging that can be. Um, uh, great work. Um, so I guess my question is, so uh, the synchronization bits, I think is, is that made very clear, but it seems like uh, some of the ideas here relates to uh, kind of like almost semantic web-like concepts. Uh, and the piece that I don't see very clearly is querying. So in terms of actually being able to use states from another place, so if the state is pushed to you as a part of kind of uh, an existing subscription, I can see how that works. But uh, what's about me wanting to access state that is not already exposed in that way? Um, so not exposed in that way. So, okay, so there's, there's a couple of pieces here. I guess one is, what if the app has not exposed the state in a particular way that you need? And then the other question I'm, I'm hearing is querying. Is there a connection between these two? Uh, I mean, I, it seems like these concepts are related to me. Uh, maybe that's not right. Uh, so it's- Sure. Okay, so I'll, I can address them both to some degree. Um, so with querying, we don't prescribe anything with querying you can do the same things you do with HTTP. Okay, so you can just put a question mark in the URL, add some arbitrary stuff. Um, this is a, it's like a key value model, just like the web. Okay, every URL is a key and it has a value at the other end of it. The difference here is that the value is changing over time. And we've added the semantics of like a DAG of time, uh, this braid, and the ability to patch and synchronize and get updates. Now, if somebody, um, so the second question is like, what if somebody hasn't added braid support to their website? And uh, you can, you don't have to add braid support. You can still use regular HTTP, but you're not gonna get the synchronization semantics. You're not gonna get guaranteed consistency. In some situations, you might just wanna add a couple of these features of braid, like maybe just the versions, or maybe just the patches. Um, it's useful to do patches without versions. For instance, if you only have a single writer, you don't really need versions. You know they're all gonna come in in a certain order, you're gonna put them all in, all in, and you still get diffs and stuff. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. You can, so you can kind of mix and match the support you're doing. You get different variations of consistency features or network efficiency, depending on which features you add. So I guess it sounds like, you know, if I want to 
query, let's say, so, okay, with the Facebook example, I want to query the feed of a particular user, but I know their name, but not the URL uh, of the, the feed object, uh, I would rely on subcat of search endpoints that's exposed to map one to the other, right? Yeah, you could imagine subscribing to that search endpoint, or you could do a search endpoint, grab the user's name or the, you know, the URL for that user's profile information. Mm -hmm. And then you could synchronize with that. Got it. Well, you can synchronize with both. Yeah, all of it. Um, have you thought about, or I'm wondering how this would fit in with like cross origin? Would we just use cores? Yeah, um, I you know I thought about that too, and I actually have a, a controversial opinion on cores. Mm. Um, I looked into the root of it. I think cores was added because, uh, like, if you've ever programmed with cores, you might have noticed that it's a pain in the ass and it sucks. And yeah, um, yeah okay. Um, so I don't think I think what we can actually get rid of it in this new world. Nice. Cores um, in I, I did some in my in my interpretation. I think cores is there because websites were already. Um, Web servers, web apps were built under the security assumption that other browsers could not access you, access a page unless the user specifically went there. And that changed when XML HTTP request was introduced. Okay, and so cores was like an oh shit moment. Okay, oh shit, we just added a feature into our web apps which allows other sites to access our servers. Well, okay, let's not allow that, <laughs> even though that's really cool, isn't it? Well, okay, let, let's let people do it if like we, if they explicitly say it's okay, which means they bake the security model into their app. I think anytime we're moving to a new app or new API for accessing on multiple sites, we can let go of that annoying cores thing. And we could do it like opt out instead of opt in. I think like web sockets, for instance, are much more permissive and the web hasn't broken. Cool. Any last question before we move on? All right. Thank you so much, Michael. That was great. Um, and I popped the, I took some notes, which Michael, you should look and see what I wrote down wrong. I tend to do that. So feel free to adjust anything that I've misconstrued. Um, and then now we have Oliver and George, I think both with NYC Mesh to talk to us about a local chat app they're building on IPFS. Do you guys have something you wanna share on the screen or just chat through something? Um, I could share my screen and just give a quick intro to NYC Mesh. Sure. Oh, oh. Sorry, I think I lost you for a sec. You're back. Cool. Yeah, you're good. Just find that share button if you wanna share something. See no, Ooh, yep. yep, almost. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We're, we're a community network. So basically what we're doing is just connecting buildings and people directly to each other with mostly rooftop wireless antennas. Pretty much just like this. We have about 300 buildings connected now across the city. Um, so two super nodes. So this, these are located at internet exchange points. So this is where we peer directly with other networks. And then we have these wireless links across the city, rooftop to rooftop, and that um, distributes the traffic. We're using um, OSPF for routing. Um, so there's two goals here. One is connecting people directly to the internet at these exchange points. We have another one over here in Brooklyn. But the other goal, which I think is a little more interesting, is creating our own network um, with internal services that will remain active even if the connection to the outside internet goes down. Um, we don't have any super serious services yet. We have like a Wikipedia clone. Um, I think some people have personal blogs and stuff, but George has been working on IPFS chat service. Um, and we've been talking about the ways we can do a lot of stuff. So it would be great to just intro that to you guys and get the feedback. Um, I don't know, George, do you want to talk about? Yep. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, super. Uh, so basically, as Oliver said, 
having a community built network offers really interesting opportunity to us. Um, it's, I mean, a lot of the broader peer to peer services are, I feel like the kind of concept is structuring the internet more like the actual social connections between people. And so uh, reflecting that in the structure of the network is a really cool opportunity. Um, so firstly, one of the benefits of having a distributed network like ours is that the resiliency model is <clears throat> not having everything be a spoken wheel model allows for uh, better resiliency each as long as we can keep a subset of the network up um, we can access the internal network even if we lose connection to the broader internet so kind of from that idea uh, i was thinking of implementing a chat service that uses ipfs uh, for the storage and distribution and the starting point was having a private swarm just for NYC Mesh. And I think there are a couple benefits. IPFS is still relatively new, and so the scale of running it uh, globally is still a little tricky. But internally within the Mesh, the scaling isn't an issue. Um, it also allows us to function completely, even if the network is partitioned from the broader internet. And that's a really interesting, um, interesting property when you consider a uh, potential, like a disaster scenario. For example, um, during Hurricane Sandy, the internet for certain neighborhoods was inaccessible for days, in some parts over a week. Uh, and back then, NYC Mesh hadn't really started but there was a mesh service in uh, a neighborhood in brooklyn and that was able to provide internet to people in that neighborhood which is a pretty impressive accomplishment and so basically the the approach that i took was having a private swarm and then having bootstrap nodes inside of the network uh, and so the bootstrap nodes was thinking of having well-known small computers like Raspberry Pis that are connected directly to antennas. Uh, and that's neat because you can run an antenna with a solar panel, Raspberry Pi as well. Uh, yeah, cuts out as many external dependencies as possible. So that's pretty much the architecture. It's a pretty simple idea to get off the ground. Um, we haven't gone very far in terms of developing something that is ready for users, but the proof of concept is in place. George, what does the bootstrap node do? Can you hear me? The bootstrap, yeah. Um, so fair warning, my knowledge of IPFS is still fairly basic. Um, the bootstrap node, when we have a client um, connect, we specify the bootstrap node for them to um, find a first peer to join. And so those are just, right now I have a Raspberry Pi running on my node. And so that's the bootstrap node. Oh, so, so the bootstrap node is for the, um, the chat app? Or yes. not for the mesh itself? Well, for the, for the mesh itself, but the chat app kind of piggybacks off of the, sorry, the bootstrap node is for running IPFS on the mesh, our local swarm. Okay, okay, yeah. cool. And so the and swarm- And the chat app piggyback. Okay, and yeah, so when ahead. you're talking about the swarm, you're talking about the, um, the chat app, you're not talking about the, uh, the, imp, the what do you call it, the, the pipes? No, no, yeah. This is on top of the actual oh, NYC okay, mesh it. networking infrastructure. Cool, okay. Awesome. Other yeah. questions? Uh, so it, it sounds like there's not yet a demo that we can pick up. Is there a repo or anything like that? Yeah, there is a repo. Um, it's 180 lines of code. Um, I think, Oliver, you're at a computer if you want to share it. 
um, on the command line, you like enter a name, it hits the bootstrap server, and then uh, chats yes, it, over the mesh. Yeah, if you could just drop that into the notes doc, that would be great. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Like they have full, they have full, like, uh, how, do you, how do we know? Um, I would, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's, it's, it's just, it's a little hard uh, to hear with the background noise. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think this might actually make a good uh, segue for, uh, for the next section. Sure. Does anybody have other questions before we move on? Um, are people using the chat app? Or how many people? No, not yet. Not yet. Um, our kind of plan long term as we develop more services on the mesh is to uh, have basically a captive portal. So when you join the mesh, or you join a public node, you see all of the different services that are available. Um, and I think that'll be a good opportunity to kind of inject those into people's habits. OK, that, so um, so the, the, the status right now is like, um, it sounds like this is a very cool idea of using an ips best chat app on the New York City mesh, um, just because it seems to fit really well with the network infrastructure itself, and it, and it should be pretty robust. And you've been developing it to some degree, and then at some point you'll be launching it, I guess, when the you've got the service availability from like pages, like here's a bunch of apps you have. Yeah, it's you know it's it's been kind of a piecemeal development effort. There's the project itself is you know has a lot of challenges, and mesh services are not the um, have not been like a burning necessity, but it is definitely a something that we're slowly working towards. Cool. Um, how has it been building it so far? Have you has it been easy or hard? Yeah. The. I mean, frankly, it was really easy. It took the the basic demo took a couple days. Um, Sweet. Yeah. All of the I have to say that the IPFS interface is very very friendly and easy to easy to use yeah especially with javascript now uh, and having a uniform interface uh, yeah it's i was surprised all right arcadi you want to take us over Thanks. to the thank you very much george and oliver that's super cool Arka, do you want to take it to the discussion you had in mind? Yeah, totally. So I think this is. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry, the uh, the background noise just like kind of scrambled my brain. Um, great. Okay. Uh, so uh, yes, I think this is actually a perfect segue into the topic that I wanted to talk about. I don't. I don't have a presentation or anything like that, but there's a uh, there's a doc that summarizes these ideas and uh, I think it's already in the yeah, it's already in the notes. Uh, so uh, uh, if you're familiar if you're not familiar with the APFS planning process, uh, what we're doing this year is basically uh, or what we've done so far this year is uh, to have kind of a public call for themes for 2020. So kind of uh, uh, North Star uh, goals uh, uh, for uh, for us to inform our development and resource allocation. And uh, the idea that I put in, uh, which is uh, you know, very grandiosely titled high social impact applications. Um, I think there's, of course, many other uh, kind of high social effect things that one can do, but this is uh, the subsets that um, uh, I, I saw as a very good fit for the uh, strengths and the mission of IPFS. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, this uh, these thoughts might be kind of obvious to people who are regular participants, kind of local offline uh, uh, matters. Uh, Oh, thank you, Terry. 
Uh, so I may be preaching to the choir to a certain extent, but just wanted to talk through this a little bit and get some feedback uh, and see if uh, you know anything uh, can uh, kind of come together out of this. So yeah, where this idea came from, uh, it has been uh, attending a lot of events uh, this year, events like um, uh, Radical Networks uh, conference here in New York, uh, a lot of uh, kind of uh, meetups and uh, other events with a focus on not just tech, but the social implications of the technology. And uh, one pattern that I saw emerging is that uh, a lot of folks in uh, kind of humanitarian uh, disciplines, so people working with everything uh, in situations ranging from refugee camps, um, sort of uh, remote or underserved regions, uh, inner city neighborhoods, um, uh, disaster zones, et cetera. Uh, they seem to have uh, kind of a consistent set of requirements for, from uh, like a technological uh, support framework, uh, even though they, you know, may, may operate in like very different scales, very different budgets. Uh, there's kind of a pattern that emerges uh, in what people uh, seem to find useful or in, I guess, in the kind of challenges uh, that they face. Uh, and uh, the similarities tend to be that uh, they work in bandwidth constrained environments. So there's usually uh, a, either unreliable, uh, altogether missing, or very ex uh, expensive uplink uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, there is a strong uh, existing community uh, that uh, has specific needs that are defined by the community themselves and not by an external actor. Uh, and uh, there is a strong need to be able to share information quickly and reliably in this local environment. And uh, uh, finally, the uh, somewhat less common, but still I think very strong requirement uh, is uh, that the tech uh, needs to be maintainable by people within the community uh, that it is serving rather than by an outside consultant or somebody like that. Uh, so, you know, so it basically keeps working without the need for uh, an, uh, an outside agent, uh, you know, being uh, present uh, on call. And uh, as, I, as I looked at, you know, as I, as I heard these stories over and over again, uh, it's uh, the the thing that really uh, stuck out to me is that uh, a lot of the properties that these organizations uh, want consistently are at least theoretically uh, enshrined in uh, IPFS uh, values and design goals. So we are we should really be able to uh, to work in these environments. Uh, better than uh, kind of a standard web stack, uh, we should be able to provide uh, local routing and resiliency and uh, content integrity that a lot of these folks need. And um, it's not, it, I, and the reality is that most, it, you know, I, actually the, the NYC mesh folks uh, have somewhat weakened this, this argument uh, but, uh, by uh, actually building on IPFS for, uh, for an environment that kind of like one I imagined. But uh, a lot of other folks don't seem to really be aware or uh, uh, actively oriented towards uh, building uh, tools for these situations uh, with, with IPFS. Uh, there is a handful uh, that uh, have used that. Uh, and a majority just built on existing web, uh, web tech. And um, basically, this made, so this, uh, I think this is a, uh, uh, an opportunity for us to reflect, uh, to understand why uh, we are rarely chosen uh, and to, perhaps try to close these gaps and make 
the tooling available uh, for uh, situations where it can make a really dramatic difference uh, in the lives of people today, uh, aligned with our kind of greater uh, social impact mission. So uh, there's not really a specific uh, uh, trajectory or agenda that I, I have laid out. Uh, it seems like there's a, a few obvious gaps. Uh, I think one of the biggest being documentation or uh, examples addressing this particular use case. Uh, I think uh, there are a, a handful of challenges that we know uh, we're facing. Uh, I think as you know, as the NYC Mesh folks uh, already saw, you know, you can't really operate on the main swarm. Uh, so a lot of people operating in um, uh, kind of disconnected or potentially disconnected network segments have adopted uh, private uh, private swarms. Um, there's uh, the you know the bootstrap node uh, is clearly a, like a single point of failure uh, in in the configuration that uh, uh, NYC Mesh adopted. You could use multiple um, uh, uh, bootstrap nodes, but that still does not eliminate the static points of failure. So I think a better bootstrap discovery mechanism is needed. Uh, uh, we need to become a little bit more aware of uh kind of different uh different connection classes so we're not trying to connect to things across a really expensive uh kind of uh, uh wan link uh when what we really want to do is work with nodes within a local network uh and a few things like that uh but it's it seems it seems like a very approachable goal and a a, a goal that uh, will have uh, a significant positive impact today, which is, I think, something that uh, we as an organization have been seeking, but not necessarily always finding. Um, so again, these are very abstract thoughts, um, uh, but I, you know, I welcome I, I, I welcome any any and all feedback. Yeah, Lido. Um, I believe there's a in the same repo. There's another proposal um, about like mobile, like um, focusing more about mobile use cases. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested about uh, the overlap because usually the communities which uh, could benefit the most from like like decentralization and technologies like that, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the local discovery story. Uh, it's always like the mobile is always in the picture, and I wonder if you have like any um, like deeper thoughts about uh, how could we like leverage mobile uh, for those high social impact applications. Yeah, no, that's actually this is something I should have pulled out right away as one of kind of the more obvious gaps. Uh, I think a lot of the time, uh, folks in disadvantaged positions are not going to be carrying around uh, like computers. Uh, uh, they will have phones, they'll probably have older phones, older Android phones, not externally performant. Um, but like battery life might also be a big concern uh, in a situation with power interruption, like you might not have a lot of opportunities to charge. So uh, I think this is some somewhere where we are very far behind uh, ACTP. Uh, for sure. Uh, and uh, I, oh, I guess one thing that I didn't really mention uh, that I feel like I should call out explicitly uh, is that I think the, in, in this situation in particular, and for reasons uh, uh, of like mobile uh, use case uh, uh, and other practical limitations, a lot of the time the uh, the people building tools for these situations will use the absolutely simplest technology that actually does the job. Like I, I think more so than uh, in uh, many other situations. Like people will generally not be building, you know, React websites with like, like tons of JavaScript. Then people, people will be building the simplest, like most static pages possible 
uh, or using off the shelf things. You know, people, uh, will, will, uh, there's a lot of like WordPress use, which is maybe not necessarily the best example of simplicity per se, but it is very, very off the shelf and uh, it is quite predictable and familiar. So uh, I think it's up to us to tell the story as to why we deliver value that uh, uh, justifies uh, using the complexity of something like IPFS. And uh, I think this is a great, um, this is a great kind of uh, proving ground uh, that uh, will be a uh, precedent for every other case where we also think need to make that argument. It's, it's going to be a little bit less um, less pressure in a sense, uh, but pushing ourselves through this uh, will, uh, I think, improve every every other situation as well. Yeah, I think that last point you raised extends mm -hmm. far beyond these use cases. Like, I, yeah. I personally find all decentralized technology to be much harder in terms of onboarding. So there's this, like, what is the actual benefit? I, there's an article, I'll drop a link in here. I did an interview with Nolan Lawson about this after he gave a talk on it at one of the last offline camps. But in my mind, you have like, amazing benefits that could make you use something you're not familiar with, really super clear benefits, or super easy onboarding. And at least one of these has to be fabulous. They can't both be unclear. Um, and I see real, like so much unfamiliar vocabulary in decentralized stuff, the, just the concept of like hosting your own thing instead of using the service that's already out there, just that federated like there's so much vocabulary and there's a talk that someone's writing up now on this like this kind of beginner friendly language problems from the last offline camp um mm -hmm. but i think that's not specific to ipfs but explaining the benefits plus making onboarding easier and vocabulary more accessible those go hand in hand and mm -hmm. have to have yeah. at least one of them amazing <laughs> Um, I also just wanted to call out the offline camp medium publication. You'll find a tab there with a collection of stories about decentralization and a tab there about developing worlds, which clearly what you're talking about isn't always developing world situations, but a lot of the constraints that you see there in terms of things I don't think about every day. I don't need to think about how the electricity affects my Wi-Fi, for example, which some folks do. Um, but there's there, I think you'll find relevant articles in the decentralization one. There are some articles on people who are living in like these intentionally, kind of like the NYC match, like we want to have a little, a little community with our own tools that we're serving on our own mesh network, um, things like that, like internet in a box kinds of things. So there's some reading there, and I'll drop a link. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to quickly respond to, to your your first points, which I fully agree with, but I also feel like uh, the amazing benefits parts can really shine in some of these situations. I think we can maybe figure out the onboarding through leveraging the benefits in a use case where like our value proposition can be relatively clear. I think with you know something like social networking, probably not going to be building that on IPFS for good reasons on uh, kind of a normal internet situation. But for, uh, uh, for example, the uh, Internet Archive folks were telling me about uh, a project where they had these Buddhist texts that were scanned and digitized and OCR'd, and they were actually bringing them back to uh, Nepalese villages literally on Yakpak. In, in these 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 servers and I, uh, I and they're they're just using normal HTML in this case but like I can just imagine being able to uh, seamlessly uh, preserve and share these these texts between like a couple of villages that are on like opposite mountain peaks or something like that and you have a way to access the collection that is shared but is also validated and uh, kind of transparently available to, to use a user. Like I think 
I think in a use case like that, we can really explain why why you want to use this tech um, without necessarily having the, 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 the most polished onboarding process, um, at least polished with the developers. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity here. I wanted to uh, piggyback on that thought. Um, kind of a, a concrete mm -hmm. project that I was considering um, mm -hmm. was how do you communicate information in politically hostile climates? Um, for example, specifically, how, how would you communicate um, in China and Western China as a Uyghur uh, and not having to use the broader internet and being able to transfer information directly from one phone to another in a private way um, seems very interesting. And being able to separate the delivery piece from the addressing, like I'm trying to send a message to my mother, but we have mutual friends and so I can pass along other people's messages through this same mechanism. Um, and that seems like something that IPFS would be uniquely suited for. Uh, we, we've had some folks try to work on literally that exact project. Um, okay. I think a couple of year, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, unfortunately, the per performance and routing stability just wasn't there at the time. Uh, but I think it's probably going to be time to revisit that idea this year because we've we've gotten our shit together uh, a little bit more. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'll just say from the perspective of the broader offline first community, not specifically decentralization, mm -hmm. there are a lot of reasons to implement an offline first pattern and they include stuff that is like generating money. Like if your thing loads faster, your company makes more money. But the arguments mm -hmm. that I think work better across audiences are the humanitarian ones. So I agree with you on that front that you can mm -hmm. find a use case in mm -hmm. this vein that will feel Mm -hmm. more warm fuzzy um and that's not like personally i prefer to hear about the use cases that come across as that than the ones that come across as down with the government down with whatever that sometimes decentralization comes off as antagonistic so i love the idea of using those kind of humanitarian cases as the example mm -hmm. so we have two more minutes any other comments on this discussion or other thoughts? Uh, I, I guess I just wanted to ask uh, maybe the NYCMS folks to chime, you know, feel free to chime in asynchronously with their experiences building something very much like this. Uh, and I'd love to maybe try to compile um, at least a theoretical, a theoretical um, Kind of use, use case lists uh, in this vein. So I would love any contributions. Awesome. And the link to that uh, GitHub issue that Arkady mentioned is in the meeting notes. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to look at the calendar for one second. We meet on the third Wednesday of the month. So for January, that will be the 15th. Um, so the same issue that you saw this meeting posted in will be renamed with a new date and we'll continue the conversation there. So if anyone has another topic they want to discuss, a demo of something cool that they want to present, um, let me know. You can always comment right on that issue. And this uh, agenda slash meeting note stock is the one we use. So I'll add a new section and we can keep adding ideas for next time. It's great to see everybody. And thank you so much, Michael and Oliver and George and Arkady for sharing and leading discussion into everybody who came to listen. Thanks everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, you guys. Bye.